our side. They hobble along the curb. Suddenly, the right foot seems to relax a little. The inward angle straightens itself out in a few paces and the limp ceases as though the leg has grown another inch. Verbal's hands are rummaging around in his pockets. The good left hand comes up with a pack of cigarettes. The bad right hand comes up with a lighter. The right hand flexes with all the grace and coordination of a sculptor's, flicking the clasp of the antique lighter with the thumb, striking the flint with the index finger. It is a fluid motion, somewhat showy. Well, those lines are from the script for the movie, The Usual Suspects. Without giving away any spoilers, the character there is someone that you think is disabled, but it turns up, turns out, maybe is not. We're going to talk about a similar scenario and whether viewing this person was a search under the Fourth Amendment today on Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Friday, April 19th, 2024. With me today is one of IJ's Fourth Amendment experts to talk about this Fourth Amendment case, and that is Mike Greenberg. Mike, welcome back to Short Circuit. It's good to be back, Anthony. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, we'll get to uh, the the other case today will be a case I will talk about, which is a case from the Second Circuit about uh, a few different things, standing, zoning, and the Establishment Clause. So it ticks a lot of short circuit boxes. First, though, we're going to get to to Mike's case from the Tenth Circuit. And um, I just learned that actually... The Usual Suspects is a is a favorite movie of of Mike's. So, um, what I I guess what draws you to that movie, and and we shouldn't give any spoilers or why I read those lines, other than what the case is about. But uh, then you can perhaps weave the the story of the Usual Suspects into the story of of this gentleman um, who was receiving veterans benefits. Yeah, it, it's it's among my favorite movies, uh, and and. If, and Part of the reason why is that unlike most modern movies, The Usual Suspects packs a ton into like 86 minutes or something like that. Uh, it doesn't feel the need to go on for two and a half hours and it tells a good, concise story of the kind of you know, crime drama that I tend to enjoy. Uh, and it's got a really good twist at the end, as you previewed. Um, can't promise a big twist in this particular uh, case, but it does it does raise uh, some similar facts as uh, exist in that movie. Well, it, it does have uh, a bit of a twist, and it also has kind of a, a larger uh, twist going on in the law that uh, that you'll you'll tell us all about. In fact, the uh, the the title, the usual suspects, might reflect uh, the the growing. Uh, split of authority on the question that this case raises and uh -huh. the fact that a lot of courts have been confronting it recently. So, uh, yeah, this case is um, United States versus Bruce Hay. It was decided by the 10th Circuit exactly a month ago, uh, March 19th, by Judges Timkovich, Murphy, and Carson, with the opinion by Judge Timkovich. Uh, and like I said, this case is another installment in – the state and federal courts attempt to grapple with long-term poll camera surveillance post-Carpenter. Our old uh, friend, cameras on poles. Our old friend, cameras on poles, yeah. Uh, dedicated listeners may remember uh, our colleague Rob Fromer discussing a case like this from the Seventh Circuit a few years back in a case called Tuggle. And our colleague Josh Windham uh, – discussing the First Circuit's version of this case, a case called Moore Bush, um, slightly after that. Um, these are cases where the government installs uh, increasingly advanced and increasingly tiny cameras on poles in public places uh, near someone's home and focuses the camera right on their home for all hours of the day um, in perpetuity, capturing everything going on outside the home or perhaps even inside through the windows of that home 
um, for months and months at a time. Uh, the cameras are often remote controlled so they can move around and they can zoom. And uh, again, they're trained specifically on one house so that officers can see everything going on at that house at all hours. Um, and there's a growing split about how these cases should come out under the Fourth Amendment. In all these cases, the the officers are installing the camera and recording the footage and, and they're able to access it for months without a warrant or an exception to the warrant warrant requirement. Uh, the, the first and seventh circuits in recent years have said, no, this is not a Fourth Amendment search. There's no warrant required. But state high courts in Massachusetts and in Colorado and I believe in South Dakota as well have come out the other way and said that this is a search that does require a warrant. So this split is growing. This is uh, a case involving a fact pattern that is a usual suspect. But none of those cases previously have led to a cert grant. Here, the 10th Circuit joins the 1st and the 7th Circuit side of the split. So to jump the gun, maybe this will be the case that finally leads to the cert grant on this question. Um, but first, we'll actually discuss this case. The facts seem to be actually pretty simple. A lot of these cases involve people accused of things like drug trafficking or firearms crimes. Um, not so here. The defendant, Bruce Hay, is an Army veteran who's living in a small town in Kansas. In 2006, after he got into a car crash, the VA classified him as permanently disabled and he started receiving benefits. Uh, some years later, the opinion says the VA got an anonymous tip uh, that Mr. Hay is in fact not totally disabled. I find it curious that there would be an anonymous tip about, <laughs> about that. I was but. thinking like maybe an ex-lover <laughs> or something on that, of that nature. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there's got to be some some person that he has a quabble with, uh, you know, in his personal life. Um, but the VA Inspector General's office starts investigating him for that, um, and they start tailing him to medical appointments and to other events, for example. Um, but apparently, that wasn't enough to find out that he is faking a disability. Uh, so they installed a pole camera on a rooftop across the street from his house. And it recorded, quote, near constant footage of his house for over two months. I believe it was 68 days in total. And it was on top of a school. On, right? on top of a school, yeah. Uh, there, he must live across the street from a school. Um, unclear from the opinion whether there's like other cameras uh, at the school that could have captured something similar already. Um, apparently not if they went through the trouble of installing this new camera. Yeah, or if they had permission from the school. I mean, I imagine they did, but it's... A little bit. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. So especially given that this is federal officials and you'd imagine the school is local. Right. Um, but yeah, finally, after over two months of recording and looking at footage of Mr. Hayes comings and goings and everything going on at his house, the VA finally felt it had enough um, evidence that he was faking his disability. And so left unsaid is whether they, uh, assumably they, they, cut off his benefit stream. Um, but here, this is a, a, um, a case arising from criminal charges, and they charged him with stealing government property and wire fraud. Um, a jury found him guilty, and one of the things that Mr. Hay appeals is that the trial court shouldn't have admitted the poll camera footage because it was obtained by violating the Fourth Amendment. Um, I'll quickly dispatch with Mr. Hayes uh, two other points of appeal before we get to the real meat here. Um, first, he argued that the evidence wasn't sufficient to support his convictions. Um, first, because he said stealing government property, um, his acts of fraud and um, deception uh, – don't amount to stealing. Those two things are different in his mind. Uh, fraud, he argued, is its own crime, and stealing is a different crime. Uh, the panel rejected that pretty quickly. It pointed to a number of cases, including an old one from the Supreme Court, holding that stealing in this particular um, statutory sense includes taking property by false pretenses, which is what he allegedly did, um, not just the narrower common law larceny. Um, he also argued that he didn't meet the definition for wire fraud uh, because his misstatements to the VA agents about his disability uh, weren't sufficiently material to the VA's choice to classify him as a disabled person. 
Uh, he's basically arguing, hey, the VA has doctors after all. Uh, they should have made their own independent judgment, not just rely on what I said or or, or cosplayed as. Um, just doesn't strike me as necessarily the strongest footing to be on, no pun intended. Um, and <laughs> Very good. The panel says, no, um, that's not what material means. Material doesn't mean that your false statement was the but for cause of the VA's classifying you as disabled, um, only that your statements were capable of influencing that choice. Um, and so that argument failed as well. Um, he also challenged the admission of a couple other pieces of evidence as violating the federal evidence rules. The court got rid of those pretty quickly. Um, and so we're left with the real meat of this case, which is the poll camera evidence. Um, Mr. Hay argued that installing a video camera focused exclusively on his house for the purpose of investigating what's going on at his house for over two months was a search under the Fourth Amendment. No one seems to dispute that there was no warrant for this. Um, the government doesn't seem to argue for any exceptions in its brief. Um, so the only question is whether this was a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. And short circuit listeners should know there are there are two fledging tests to uh, get to the bottom of that question. Uh, one is whether the government physically intruded onto a um, – area that is protected by the Fourth Amendment. Here, Mr. Hayes' home and the curtilage immediately surrounding that home. Uh, no one seems to suggest that that happened here. Uh, maybe if they had installed the camera on his property, um, it would, but um, it was across the street here. So there's no argument on that front. So we fall back to the other test, um, the CATS test, which asks whether the government violated a person's subjective expectation of privacy and whether society recognizes that expectation as objectively reasonable. Uh, it's one of the more famous tests in all of law. Um, and the first thing that stood out to me about this opinion is that the court doesn't really examine whether Mr. Hay had a subjective expectation of privacy in the area immediately surrounding his home, the area that the government was surveilling. Maybe that's because the panel just concedes that he did, um, although that's not how cases like this always seem to go. Sometimes courts say that there's no subjective expectation of privacy if, for example, there's not a fence to hide the area from public view um, or, or something like that. You have to actually do something affirmative to demonstrate that you have an expectation of privacy in that area. Um, so that, I found that a little strange. Maybe it's because the panel just doesn't need to reach it because it decides that the objective factor is dispositive against Mr. Hay. Right. Um, that might have been way, a trickier issue then. Yeah. Um, but either way, it's 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 certainly a little curious. I, I know in the in the first circuit's iteration of this case, um, at least one of the lead opinions says that um, – there was a subjective expectation of privacy just because uh, the person who was being surveilled lived in a quiet neighborhood. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, I went back and uh, heard that episode from about a year or two ago uh, and uh, we all found that kind of confounding as well. So, so maybe this is just a confounding question that courts uh, don't want to have to get to or, or, or don't know how to deal with. Yeah, which is um, kind of inherent in the cat's test anyway. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, they, they definitely seem to be collapsing the two uh, prongs. Um, but either way, the court jumps immediately to the objective prong um, and it runs through some familiar case law dating to the 1970s and the 1980s, which says that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy from people viewing things that are in public view. Uh, the famous quote is from a case called California versus Serralo, where the Supreme Court 5-4 uh, majority held that the Fourth Amendment protection of the home, quote, has never been extended to require law enforcement officers to shield their eyes when passing by a home on public thoroughfares. Um, that, according to the court, is totally dispositive here. The government installed the camera – in a public place on top of a school or at least a place that you know people have a right to be at. Um, and anyone in that place could have seen every single thing that the camera captured if they had just 
stood there and watched, no matter how impractical it is, that they no one would actually just stand there and watch for 68 days. Um, so there's no problem, according to the court. And in fact, a Tenth Circuit case from about 20 years ago involving camera surveillance held exactly that. So in the court's view, this case is open and shut under that old Tenth Circuit case. But Mr. Hay says, what about this case called Kylo from the Supreme Court in 2001? In that case, the police used from the um, street area a thermal imaging device to detect the temperature inside someone's house. Um, they were trying to see whether there are marijuana plants growing inside, and apparently that requires a lot of heat. Um, the Supreme Court said that was a search because the police there were gathering information about the inside of the house that you couldn't otherwise get without trespassing or using technology that is not in, quote, general public use. The court here rejects that argument because neither of those conditions applied here. The information could have been seen with the naked eye from public view. Um, again, assuming someone was just standing there for 68 days unmoved. Um, and the technology that the government used to assist it in gathering that information, cameras, are for better or worse in general public use. And we'll have a little more on that later. Um, so what's all the fuss about? Um, all the fuss is about a case from the Supreme Court in 2018 called Carpenter that Mr. Hay and candidly I uh, think really upended things. Um, in Carpenter, the court held that accessing the records of our cell site location information, which are, uh, I'm not super tech savvy, but I'm given to understand are the, the stamps that our cell phones are constantly creating, showing where we were by pinging the nearest cell tower as our cell phones are in our pockets. Um, the court held that accessing that information over an extended period of time is a search. The government had argued in that case that it wasn't a search because the same information, your location at any given moment, the government could just gather by tailing you um, all throughout the public streets with the kind of old school trench coat wearing cop um, who's who's in, you know in an old sedan, um, and the government rightly pointed out that no one suggests that that would be a search. Um, but Carpenter says that's not the same thing. It says that pursuing a suspect for a brief stretch is just objectively different from secretly monitoring and cataloging every single movement of an individual for an extended period of time. Basically, the thrust is it just becomes too easy to gather an, quote, all-encompassing record of the person's movements. And so Mr. Hay says that Carpenter, um, the analogy from Carpenter to this case is pretty straightforward. Sure, someone could have gotten equivalent information that the camera captured by just standing on the street and staring at his house for two months straight. Um, but like two months of tailing someone throughout the public streets while wearing a trench coat, that's just not realistic. Um, and in any sense, this just makes it too darn easy to learn everything about when he comes and goes, when he has visitors, uh, who those visitors are and when they leave, when he receives packages, all of some of the more intimate things about us. It just becomes too easy for the government to, to track those things. Uh, and even if theoretically a nosy neighbor might see a, a few of those things maybe a couple of times over the course of two months – this kind of comprehensive real-time catalog of those activities is just objectively different in a way that Carpenter uh, distinguished tailing someone through the streets. The panel says no. Uh, it reads Carpenter uh, very narrowly and very according to its facts. Uh, it says Carpenter was about all of your movements on, you know, all of your movements everywhere. Um, but here, the government's only getting your movements to and from your home, which is just some subset of those movements. <laughs> so if it had uh, cameras throughout the city, that might be different. And in fact, it, it cites a Fourth Circuit case where the, the city of Baltimore had a, 
kind of an eerie program exactly like that, where it had cameras um, hovering in the air all throughout the city. Um, it, it gives a little CF to that Fourth Circuit case and says, well, that might be different. Yeah, and we talked about it was like four years ago now, I think. But we talked about that uh, opinion at, at one one point. I think it went on bonk and was found unconstitutional at, at, at that stage, right? Exactly right. Yeah, that case is called uh, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, I believe. Um, Beautiful name. Indeed. Uh, so the panel also says that Carpenter was about backward looking surveillance. Basically, the government could pick any time period in the past and see your movements. And this is different because this is about real time surveillance. It's about in the moment or forward looking surveillance. And so that's a distinction from Carpenter. Um, and it says that Carpenter expressly did not want to disturb the Fourth Amendment's application to surveillance cameras. Carpenter has this kind of throwaway line that, you know, nothing in our opinion should cast doubt on surveillance cameras, um, which I think is the panel's kind of strongest point. But I think all those points are easily um, easily responded to. Um, sure, Carpenter was about your movements on the public street, but the Supreme Court has said repeatedly for Fourth Amendment purposes uh, the home is first among equals. Uh, so as Mr. Hay pointed out, why should there be any less protection for information about your home, especially when your home is where some of the more intimate activities happen, where you have visitors come to and from, uh, where you have packages delivered, where you are going to and from every single day rather than just kind of incidentally being on a street somewhere. Um, I don't understand why the backward looking rather than real time surveillance distinction should matter. Um, the implication seems to be from the panel, although they don't quite say so, that the real time surveillance requires a lot more effort. Um, so it's less unreasonable. But that doesn't seem to make sense here where all they're doing is installing a camera and just letting it do its thing. It's 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 not like they are uh, actually standing there and doing the work such that it makes it less unreasonable. Um, and then there's that line in Carpenter about not wanting to upend security cameras as a surveillance tool. Um, it's not totally clear from the opinion in Carpenter whether the court meant that as security cameras in the more general sense, you know, those that might be outside of a business or, you know, kind of in uh, just kind of like monitoring a neighborhood or watching over an area generally to keep it safe, as opposed to the far more intrusive and like singularly targeted security cameras yeah. focused on a uh, one particular house. I mean, this is not a typical security camera because you think a security camera is either a public space or the property owner is using it on their own property. Right. And it's, it's just happening to uh, gather things for the sake of, I guess, protecting public safety or, right. you know, security. Um, I guess it's in the name. It's not a spy camera. It's a security exactly camera. right. This this kind of targeted surveillance at one particular house um, for for a clear, explicit investigative purpose um, seems fundamentally different. And it's not clear that Carpenter was was getting at the latter. It seems like it might have been targeted more toward the former. Um, so that shouldn't be dispositive either. So uh, I think Mr. Hay has some really good arguments that if we look at things through the analytic lens that Carpenter gives us, Carpenter really should upend things. Um, but the court says, no, uh, our existing precedent um, totally controls this. Carpenter, Kylo, nothing changes that. The court ends with this kind of, uh, I thought, kind of shockingly uh, sad ode about uh, the fact that all sorts of cameras are ubiquitous in society now, um, and that means that, quote, regrettably, the reasonable expectation of privacy from filming is diminished, end quote. And that just can't be right, or it it surely doesn't need to be right, even under Carpenter. Um, it feels like the original sin here that this panel is engaging in and that the the Seventh Circuit, the First Circuit are engaging in is that courts are creating what I'll call a denominator problem, if you will. The teaching of Carpenter is – or at least it should be – that we don't look to whether any individual moment of this surveillance technique could have – theoretically been gathered by someone just kind of existing in public or by a nosy neighbor. Rather, we need to look to the whole of what the government's actual surveillance technique actually was and ask, 
whether people reasonably expect that technique. It, there's a huge difference between a nosy neighbor in a single moment peering over and saying, oh, there's a package being delivered now, to being able to see every single instance in a comprehensive chronicle of every single thing going on on that property. Um, it reminded me of um, – and the panel actually gives a shout out to um, Google Earth here and it says, well, you know, that program allows people to view backyards at any given moment. And so there's just a diminished expectation of privacy uh, in someone's backyard is what the panel is implying um, or, you know, the the aerial image of their property. And it reminds me of a case that I'm litigating uh, where – the government uh, used a drone multiple times over the course of multiple months flying all around our client's backyard to gather as much information about what's going on on that property as possible. And the government, after we challenged that as violating the Fourth Amendment, uh, said, well, you know, there's Google Earth and, and maps and all sorts of the stuff that allows you to get a snapshot of the person's backyard. So what's the big deal? And our response to that is, well, that gives you a single snapshot in time at the behest of Google whenever it happens to capture that snapshot. Maybe it's updated once every couple of years. What this new technology allows you to do is get a chronicle every single day, any given moment that you want uh, of what that person's property looks like. Uh, so it's just fundamentally different and it's not what people expect, even if they expect that there's a single picture of what their property looks like that's updated every couple of years. Um, I think the same thing has to be true here. If a neighbor might look over, you know, once a month or every now and then seeing what's going on on your property, it's just different than, uh, this, this kind of perpetual targeted surveillance at all times. And so the, the upshot for Mr. Hey, right, is not only did he lose his veterans benefits but he's prosecuted and found guilty of some pretty serious stuff so uh this whether or not this evidence you know is uh, can be used against him is a pretty big deal it is um although it, it's not discussed in the opinion because um apparently the panel didn't need to reach it finding that it wasn't a fourth amendment violation but there's also this issue of the exclusionary rule that's lurking in the background and that's in the government's brief actually um it probably unfortunately for mr hay i think the most likely outcome of even if the government had lost the motion to suppress and the panel here found a fourth amendment violation there's this case called davis versus united states from the supreme court in 2011 that says that when Binding appellate precedent says the officers could have done what they did um, and only later is that precedent overturned on appeal. Um, then the exclusionary rule uh, requiring that evidence be suppressed as a, as a remedy for Fourth Amendment violations doesn't apply because the purpose of that rule is to deter Fourth Amendment violations. And when the officers are relying on appellate precedent saying that they can do this thing, well, you know. It's, it's hard to deter right. that conduct. You want them to listen to judges. Um, there's all kinds of problems with that rule that, that are not presented in this case. But even if there had been a Fourth Amendment violation here, the panel almost certainly would have fallen back and said, well, it doesn't get excluded either way. And, and also there is – you get the sense of why they're talking so much about the camera because there's other evidence that he was not on the up and up with his disability, right? There was someone who tailed him and said – uh, he took this exam at the VA and then um, what it says when he believed that he was out of the VA site, Mr. Hay drove over to a pawn shop, walked in without assistance or his cane or his wife and walked out carrying a toolbox. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it seems like there's plenty of other evidence. I don't you know, I'm not the master of the government's you know choice in how they prosecute their cases. And maybe there's just all sorts of additional evidence that they had to get in order to you know, feel comfortable in their case or to revoke his benefits separate from this criminal case. But yeah, it definitely seems like this this whole uh, massive intrusion on his security uh, may not have been necessary because you can just kind of apparently just see it from following him around in public yeah. that what he told the doctors is not what is truly the case. I wonder if there's um, something in the VA's you know, rules or policies that allow them to say, hey, every five years or so, come on back and let's do a recheckup. Um, and, and if they could you know, figure it out that way. Um, 
but yeah, as you're saying, the whole thing seemed a little unnecessary. And so I don't have too much to add to uh, how Mike has explained this this case and the the split of authority. But this is definitely cameras on poles. This is not the last time that we're going to be faced with it on short circuit. I will add though that a lot of the issues that are in this case that then intersect with other Fourth Amendment issues, including. Um, when a property is an open field, which isn't uh, an issue here, but it can be, especially when we have cameras on that property, um, as we're litigating in, in other cases at IJ, all of that will be on the table at our coming uh, conference on the open field doctrine at 100 years that I'm going to give a little another plug for here. If you are in the Washington, D.C. area, you can come to our headquarters at the Institute for Justice in Arlington, Virginia, 901 Glebe Road, and um, participate in our conference, which is the afternoon of Friday, May 10th, where we'll have some Fourth Amendment scholars there and IJ attorneys to talk about the the we're going to talk about the um, the open fields doctrine, but also on the table are a lot of other things swirling around in, in the Fourth Amendment world, including the positive law model, which uh, we don't need to go into today. But we talked about before we had Professor Dan Epps, who's going to be at the conference. We had him on a short circuit last fall to talk about his work on the, the positive law model, which is basically he has his own take on it. But basically, there's a few scholars who have said the government should abide by the rules that everyone else has to abide by. And if they do that, then something's not a search. But if they do, then there's Fourth Amendment issues. That's like the real 30,000 foot way of thinking about it. And then they disagree on aspects of that. And we're going to have a little bit of a debate or a discussion on how that should work with both the open fields doctrine and more generally. And I was thinking of that in, in this case because – uh, just to maybe close on this issue that, um, you know, you or me, Mike, if we went to a school and said, hey, can I put a camera on top of your property and at this neighbor? I don't think that would work very well unless I was best friends with a principal or something. But um, if you're a federal agent, <laughs> it's probably a lot easier to get to go and do that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done a deep dive into Kansas state tort law or anything, but that's that's a similar thing, right? It feels like if you're got a camera trained on the front door of your neighbor's house, like maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it feels like it should be a privacy related tort under the common law or under statutory yeah. law. Um, but when you're the government uh, under current law, that really doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, it 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 th there's a a in in Justice Gorsuch's separate opinion in Carpenter, actually, he kind of makes exactly this point where he's describing an old case under the the well, if it's exposed to the public, there's there's no problem doctrine, and it's a case involving a helicopter called Florida versus Riley, where the government flew a helicopter all around this person's uh, backyard um, at like low altitudes, trying to see if he was growing uh, illegal green plants. Uh, and you know, the court in that case said that there's no problem. And 25 years later, Justice Gorsuch in his separate opinion in Carpenter says, oh, really? Try that one out on your neighbors. Yeah, I love that line. Which is among my favorite lines in any Supreme yeah, Court Yeah, I, I literally started laughing when I read that opinion by Gorsuch <laughs> in, that, in that line. Well, um, yeah, so we'll, we will probably talk about that uh, also at the conference. So if you are interested in coming, unfortunately, we're not going to uh, – it's not going to be live streamed. But if you are in the D.C. area and you'd like like to come, uh, we have a link in the show notes for you to RSVP. We'd love to see you. So now we are going away from uh, Kansas and cameras and all that in the Tenth Circuit to the Second Circuit, where a very different issue, but um, which gets close to uh, as aspects of an issue we we talk about here at Short Circuit a lot and have lately on Bound by Oath, our sister podcast, and that's zoning. So we have zoning, standing, and the Establishment Clause. We are in the village of Chestnut Ridge, New York, which um, Mike has uh, connections to the New York area. And I was, I was just talking about him in the green room um, that he hasn't been to the village of Chestnut Ridge, but he knows about the town that Chestnut Ridge is in, which is the um, town of Ramapo. And New York has this 
this system, a lot of New York state where there's like a town and then there's a village within a town and they both kind of have jurisdiction. It's kind of like a county and a municipality, but I guess New York loves to layer on the layers of, of, of uh, government. Um, so in and any they case, also have hamlets on top of that. Oh as gosh. Well. Okay. We're not going to go there, but, um, <laughs> for purposes of, of, of our discussion today, we're just talking about the village and it's zoning law. So it has the power to do zoning laws. Um, it's on the New York, New Jersey border, kind of up the Hudson, but well within the, the New York city, uh, metropolitan area. So it's basically, you know, a suburb and they have a large Orthodox Jewish community, um, in the, in the village. And, um, it came to pass that there was a push to have, uh, make it easier to have, um, houses of worship in residential areas because, it, as many of you know, um, if you're an, if you're Orthodox and you're Jewish, um, you can't do certain things on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath, of course, is a big day to go to synagogue, and so you can't. The the rule for for many Orthodox Jews is you can't drive on the Sabbath, but you need to get to synagogue, and so that means you walk. So in Orthodox neighborhoods, you see all kinds of people walking on the Sabbath. Well. If you, you you can't if you have to drive five miles to get to the synagogue, that makes it hard. So there was a push to have more um, allow for more houses of worship in residential areas. Now this is a big deal across the country. If you look at zoning codes, right, even zoning codes that are single family, so you can't have a business in a neighborhood, they at least often will allow for schools and um, houses of worship, worship worship at least on the smaller side. Um, in residential neighborhoods. So it was hard to do this and the, the, the details don't really matter. They, they made it easier. And if you, in the district court opinion, I learned that it's not in the, the second circuit opinion that it's, it, this is like a smaller house of worship. So for a lot of Christians, you might call this a house church. Uh, between 15 and 49 people visiting more than 12 times a year is essentially what they liberalize. So that was good for the Orthodox community, but there were some people in the town who did not like this. And they said, there's gonna be more traffic and all the usual complaints you have when you have so-called NIMBYs, not in my backyard types. So they, we don't want this change in the zoning. There's one quote in the opinion, they said, it's going to transmorgify the character of the village. I don't- Radically. Yeah, radically, right. Transmorgifying <laughs> all over the place, whatever that means. So they didn't like this, so they went to court. And they have, uh, interestingly, they have an establishment clause violation. They say they only did this for the Orthodox community. It wasn't like, you know, there were pu pushes from many uh, different faiths for this, even though any faith could get this permit for your own house of worship. Uh, could this get this exemption for your own residential house of worship? But really it was just the Orthodox, and so therefore it's an establishment clause violation. Now, that's the... Court does not get to the merits. And I think if they got the merits, they'd probably lose. Uh, but that can be a discussion for another day. So uh, they essentially they say, look, this is um, this this makes an this is an injury because I have to deal with these additional houses of worship that are unconstitutionally being placed there. And also there's uh, other kinds of harms like more traffic. And, 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 and that kind of thing. And that's an injury. And that gives me standing in federal court and I can sue about it. And so this uh, association, neighborhood association is one plaintiff. And then there's some individuals who are plaintiffs who live in the village. Now, an interesting thing about the standing analysis is it brings up something that doesn't come up that much. And that's taxpayer standing at the municipal level. So we don't need to go into the in, all the ins and outs of the, the standing arguments in this case. The, the long story short is the plaintiffs lose. They do not have standing to sue. And we at IJ are generally very supportive of a broad understanding of standing because narrow understandings of standing often get in the way of people actually having their civil rights enforced. So you can disagree with the plaintiffs on you know, their motives here or the, the not wanting to liberalize zoning, but you could maybe agree with them that they should be able to have standing. Well, one, the, so the interesting thing about taxpayer standing in this case is many of you probably know that if you are just suing as a taxpayer, 
who are saying the government is doing something unconstitutional and it is using tax dollars to do that, you can't get standing just for that in federal court. So if the federal government is spending money in a way you think violates whatever of the Constitution and you go to court, you can't have a ruling in your favor. That's old law. That's over 100 years old uh, now. The U.S. Supreme Court has, has said that. And if it's a state, you also, it's the same idea. You can't get taxpayer standing just because, you like, I think the state of Minnesota, where I live, is doing something bad, and I'm a taxpayer, and they're using, you know, however much it is, a few pennies of my of my money to 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 um, do something that violates the Constitution, can't do that. But at the city level, level, sometimes you can do that. And the reason for that, there's, there's not that much case law on this, but there's some. And the reason for that is cities, uh, if you ever see the, the official name of a city, it says a, a corporation. Cities are often, you know, incorporated. That's because at, at that level, residents of cities are kind of seen like shareholders in a public corporation. And so if, you know, if I have stock in IBM, and I think IBM's board is doing something that's bad or against the corporate charter or whatever, I could go to court to try and stop that. And I have standing as a shareholder. So the idea is, well, at the, the city level, because it's smaller, uh, right? And uh, we're talking about um, not that many people. So a lot of the worries you have with, say, taxpayer standing at the federal level aren't there. In certain circumstances, you can go to court. But it it's kind of narrow. So it's like a certain pot of money, say some bonds are being issued or a grant, and that itself is unconstitutional or illegal, you might have standing to stop that. But if it's just, you know, the police officer is enforcing this law, I think is unconstitutional. Of course, a few pennies of my property tax go to the police officer's salary. That's not enough. And so they make this argument, and the particulars in this case aren't, aren't super interesting, but essentially... The city is going to be processing permits for this new zoning scheme. That, of course, takes some money. Therefore, we have standing. The Second Circuit says, no, you do not have standing. That's just too speculative. Okay, so that's one. That's municipal uh, taxpayer standing. Then we get to establishment clause. So establishment clause famously is like this one area of the Constitution where standing rules don't apply uh, in a lot of ways. And it's because of this kind of zany uh, understandable, but a little zany, a Warren court case called Flass versus Cohen, where they say, with well, establishment clause, because it's hard to address an establishment clause violation because of standing rules, we relax them a little bit. So 10th Amendment, amendment cases. Uh, many of you remember this, like uh, uh, putting a, a, not 10th Amendment. I got 10th Amendment on the mind. 10 Commandments, 10 Commandments cases. So say you have a... Uh, Copy of the Ten Commandments on the wall of a courthouse was one famous case, and at the in the same term, the court Supreme Court also addressed a um, a plaque of the Ten Commandments by a capital, by a state capital. Does that violate the Constitution? Well, you can have standing to address that, but this only goes so far, and it's really been narrowed since the days of the Warren Court. So, establishment clause standing can't just be you know there there's something kind of in the ether that might offend my religious sensibilities or, you know, my sensibilities as a different religion or an atheist or whatever. And so I can't, you don't have standing for that. And they said, look, you don't have standing just because there might be a few more synagogues in, in, in the town. We don't even know where they are yet. Right. That, so that they, they haven't been built. Uh, they haven't, they haven't processed the paperwork. And so you don't have standing for that. And then the final attempt at standing is standing that often works in zoning cases that a lot of so-called NIMBY lawsuits uh, arise under. And that's, okay, my neighbor uh, got a permit to be able to, say, upzone his property so he can have another unit, right? Something we at IJ are very supportive of, people using their property rights to add more housing. But say you're a neighbor and you just don't like that you go to court, usually you have standing for that because your standing is there's going to be more noise next door or there's going to be more parking on the street or whatever it is. And so that is your standing to get in the court. Here, they said, well, okay, that could happen, but you haven't identified any neighbors of the actual plaintiffs where there is going to be more traffic or more noise because we don't even know where they are yet. Uh, you're just talking about a generalized fear that there's going to be some 
uh, additional traffic or some additional noise somewhere in the city because of this ordinance. And that's not enough. That's too speculative. So that's not enough for standing. So I say you don't have standing for that. And then finally, they say your association doesn't have standing because part of the rules of associational standing, um, which is a way to uh, a little bit thinking of, of like a class action where you have a group of people suing and you don't have to bother getting everyone who's part of the group named as a plaintiff. Well, uh, you need at least one plaintiff who has standing, who's an individual member of the group. And same problem, you don't have, you haven't shown me that person. And so the association doesn't have standing. So at the end of the day, no standing. Uh, the Orthodox community can, can get their new houses of worship. Now it could, in the future, there could be a lawsuit about one of those individual properties that maybe could have standing, but there's no standing here. I had two snooty observations about this case <laughs> and, and one that actually deals with the substance. Uh, first was that uh, you mentioned that there's an association that is, I think, the lead plaintiff here. Uh, I don't think you mentioned the name of that association, which is uh, Citizens United to Protect Our Neighborhoods. Yes. Uh, one, the acronym is coupon, which I found amusing. Um, but second, they started with Citizens United. And I thought that groups like this wouldn't want to touch that name with a 10 foot pole after this century's most <laughs> misunderstood Supreme Court case. Um, I don't know. Maybe they like Citizens United. Maybe they're all about, you know, free speech when it comes to uh, political speech, but just just not. But they love zoning. I don't know. Per Certainly a possibility, and I I I, I don't uh, I don't fault them for that. Um, second was that you know the the quote of uh, this is going to radically transmogrify the character of the village. You know there there like two points on that front. One, these changes are designed to make it easier for he, for people to gather walking to places and gather, you know, together like old school village style. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I found that a, an, an odd um, dichotomy. And and also the idea that this is radically transmogrifying the character of the village when not one of the plaintiffs can allege that this is actually happening like near where they live or like there's actually any problems that they, you know, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis just, just felt um, – sort of disconnected um, on the actual merits. I was fully expecting this opinion to read like a sort of a shell game under which the panel is kind of feigning the idea that, well, someone might have standing um, if you, you know, stand on one foot and, you know, dance through all these hoops that are in reality so impossible to do that no one is ever going to have standing um, because that's often how standing opinions sort of, are they they're used as kind of an excuse to um, get rid of cases that courts don't want to hear on the merits, at least in my experience. Um, but that's really not how this reads at all. Um, it at times reads like a roadmap, a roadmap, excuse me, where the court is um, laying out some pretty plausible things that these plaintiffs could allege if those allegations actually existed, um, such that someone could have standing like, hey, find a plaintiff. Uh, who lives on a street where there's actually some problems here. Um, it, it, it really kind of gave up the ghost on the idea that um, there's there's uh, just kind of, I don't like this generally speaking, which right. is, uh, as you said, uh, not enough for, for standing even under the establishment clause. Yeah, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to there being standing here for a law that does change things in the village that probably will have an impact going forward. Um, and we at IJ, again, like liberalized standing rules because it, 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 it allows someone who is going to be affected by a law that is unconstitutional to try to get ahead of that. Um, the, the, the phrase often is that uh, you don't it shouldn't just it shouldn't be that the, the, the case is ripe as in you're being injured right now, it's that there are ripening seeds of injury in the future. And so you try to get ahead of that before anyone gets hurt. Now here on the actual merits, I think it's ridiculous to think that, you know, additional houses of worship are going to be, um, well, even putting the constitution aside are going to be bad for the city. Um, but I would say that about, you know, doing anything with property, 
business or an additional unit or, or, or whatever it is, as long as it's you know, reasonable uses your prop of your property. But um, so I do see some danger there for that part of the uh, of the opinion. But for the for other parts of the analysis, yeah, I think they they were pretty fair in trying to just to give them a chance. But they didn't have anything um, that they that they put in in front of the court to be able to 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 address that. I will say though, I wonder if the like part of the tactic here is, you know, if if say there was a, a I don't know if this is a, what they call it, but a, a house synagogue like a house church, and a permit had actually been issued, and then you sue about that, then everything gets a lot more personal, right? And you're saying this, you know, there's an establishment clause, these people who walk to this place, that that's a lot harder to deal with than just in the abstract, right? This uh, this law is unconstitutional and we're, t we're talking about general principles here and, and all that. So I wonder if that's part of the tactic and maybe we will, maybe we won't see it, you know, additional litigation here. I think that might be right, but also it, it kind of goes to show that perhaps this claim on the merits wasn't all that strong to begin with, and especially if you're afraid to bring it later on, right? Uh, that that perhaps shows that uh, it's 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 not the strongest claim uh, in the first place. I I also I don't know the ins and outs of our Lupa case law at all. Our Lupa being the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Uh, it's a, a thing that we've I think sometimes um, chatted about on short circuit. Yeah, um, but. Part of me was wondering uh, whether this is actually just a cost savings measure by the village to have to avoid getting bogged down in defending our lupa suit, which allow kind of sp uh, special rules for religious land uses, um, which makes the taxpayer standing kind of on the merits a little a little harder to grapple with in the first place. Abs but I, absolutely. That's a really good point because our, if they had been denied this opportunity, that – Certainly could be. I don't know a lot about our Lupa either, but certainly could be uh, our Lupa claim. Well, thank you, Mike, for uh, this journey on cameras on poles and the usual suspects, which you all should go and see if you haven't. And um, even Ro Lupa uh, and, and standing in the Second Circuit. We'll have more cases next week. Uh, thank you for joining us. But in the meantime, oh, you should also sign up for our Open Fields Conference if you're in the Washington, D.C. area on May 10th. But in the meantime, I hope that all of you get engaged. Mm -hmm.